y'all this is where we had the faucet coming up when the garden was up here and the guys took it out but obviously this has to be backfilled and I don't know what they're doing with it. Anyway, last night I was headed out here to milk the goats. It was dark and um, almost fell right in that hole. I did not, thankfully I caught it. But I was like, that would be so discouraging. I was feeling so good. I'm like, I'm going out to milk my goats. It's so great. And then I almost fall in the water hole. Oh, it feels like the most lovely lush spring morning. I know it's technically not spring yet, but we're getting close. So the first couple of days with the new goatee girls has been really lovely. Um, Benjamin had a baseball tournament this weekend. So Maya has been pretty slammed with that. Today's the first day he actually had to do any sort of projects. So he's working on the milking stanchion today because that's, that's the highest priority. The goats actually stand surprisingly well without being in a stanchion. Um, I was shocked, never in my life have, have I had a goat that would like stand to let me milk her uh, without being held in in some way. Oh, hey there, cutie. Good morning, Fernie. She thinks I'm out here to milk her. Sorry to disappoint you, Fernie girl. I'm not the one. Good morning, Carol. She's starting to look very Devon. Y'all, I just love walking over this. Jeremiah put this in when the foundation or the concrete was done in here. Roots and Refuge 2022 with all of our initials. Technically, the barn was built in 2021, but we didn't put that concrete down until a few weeks later, which by then it was 2022. I can't believe we've been here for as long as we have. Interestingly, having milking chores for myself, which we've obviously, we've had the cows this whole time, but when the cow operation got so big that it was necessary to use the machine and there was a lot of heavy lifting, Jeremiah just kind of came up with a system and took that over. Um, he has Wes, comes out a couple days a week and does the milking, kind of gives Jeremiah a break. And it has not been on my plate. I have milked some, uh, but typically it's just like when Jeremiah is covering baseball and you know, we have to do the tag team thing. It hasn't been my regular routine though. So now having milking as a regular routine in morning and evening, is very good for me. Um, I am diagnosed with ADHD and I know that's kind of like a, a hot topic these days and it's something a lot of people are talking about and I think there's still a lot to be understood about it. However, understanding that about myself has given me a lot of grace for myself. And one thing that I have really learned is that I do better overall in life when I have um, non-negotiable obligations that create structure and routine. Um, I am very lax. I like flying by the seat of my pants in my life because my brain does ha often have like, think about like browser windows open on a computer. Like I often have 25 open at one time. Like the problem with that is, is that if I don't have structure, I end up just going to the squeakiest wheel to give the grease. And unfortunately a lot of things fall through the cracks. And so for me, when I have structure that's like non-negotiable, like I will be doing this at this time, I will be doing this at that time, it will not change. Um, I can kind of attach other tasks to that and create a lot more routine in my life. Whereas if I don't have those things, I can get really overwhelmed. So this is obviously early on, like having the goats back and the milking back, but just a few days in, I'm like, oh, I remember how good this is for me. I remember how this makes my thought processes on my to-do list a lot easier to manage. It makes it so much less overwhelming, which I guess it's kind of silly because it's like, wait, you have a chore that requires you to be in your barn twice a day and it somehow makes you feel like you have an easier time with all you have to do.
I'm going to put some hot water in this bucket and warm up this bottle for uh, Wit, the bottle baby. Last night I was bottling milk and there was only like this much left in the bucket and I went ahead and made this bottle for him just because I didn't want to do like a, you know, a quarter filled jar to put in the fridge. It's just hot water. I'm going to set that in while I milk, which is not going to get it too hot, but it'll take the edge of the cold off. Wit's not a tiny bottle, baby. I mean, he's, I think, like eight weeks old or something like that. So he probably would be fine with cold milk. I think he's probably used to having cold milk, but, you know, <laughs> seems like a nice thing to have a warm bottle. What's up, Sowards? Sorry, I'm cramping your style. Okay. <laughs> Styles are meant to be cramped. <laughs> Good morning, girls. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so I don't have a milk stanchion yet, and that means that this is not the best time to make videos. So I'm gonna try to get some clips, but our our milking chats will have to wait until I can contain the goats. Michaela's here, Jeremiah's little sister. Hello. You're just a silhouette. So let me go around the other way. There, now you can see her face. <laughs> uh, she just got here. She's gonna help me out. And Maya is working on the, the stanchion today, which is good. Uh, they are really great. I was, was joking that they're unicorns. They're beautiful, stand so nicely, uh, but I don't want them to figure out that they can just run off. I don't want to develop really bad habits. So right now I'm milking them right here and I'm just kind of like pinning them against the wall so they can eat out of this trough and I'm sitting next to them. And that seems to be working okay. Last night was a little more chaotic than it has been. And so therefore that's why the stanchion is high priority. You're last. You're too pushy. You gotta wait for last. Alright, my camera got knocked over. That's my cue to stop trying to film. Um, I just finished up the milking. And this milk. We're getting about a gallon of milking, which is really good. See ya, Fernie. Hey, roosters. Now, onto the greenhouse. I'm gonna go take a look at my seedlings. I may put a few more seeds in the soil this morning. And then I've gotta head back in and get in the kitchen. I've been watching the forecast. And as of right now, there aren't any freezing nights in the next 10 days. It will most likely freeze again. Uh, but I'm so tempted to fill my fountain back up. The only thing is, is that I'd have to empty it back out if it was going to freeze. Goodness. It is already warm in here today. My friend Cass's seedlings are looking really good. She got some of her tomatoes started before I did. Mine are a little, little behind, but look. We have our very first true leaves starting to come up which which is good so i wait till the true leaves come up and then i'll separate these these are leeks which i may be trying to grow during the wrong time of year so we're having um, you know, <laughs> high hopes, but reasonable expectations. Such an exciting time. So today I'm going to go ahead and start my basil seeds. And I do this much like I do tomatoes. So on the tomatoes and the peppers, a lot of times I'll sow them relatively thickly and then very gently tease the plants apart and tease the roots apart and pot them up. Um, into their own individual pots so they can grow larger and I've done it that way for a long time specifically with tomatoes it works really well and I'm, I've got old videos talking about that I'm gonna sh once those get big enough to separate I'm gonna shoot a new video about like how I start tomato seeds so if you're if you haven't started your seeds yet I'll that video will probably be coming up in the next week or something like that 
but um, I do basils the same way. So if you don't start from seed and you go to a store and you get a basil started plant, seed starts for one, plant starts are so expensive this year. I looked, I just popped in and looked at why I was at Tractor Supply the other day and they've gone up a lot the last few years when you know with since covid people showed a lot more interest in gardening and of course where there's demand um you know a lot of times prices will rise because the demand's there unfortunately um but with basil you can propagate from a basil plant and a lot of times if you buy a one of those little four inch pots and you're paying four or five dollars for that one plant if you actually look there will be multiple stems coming up from the soil and you may actually have like eight plants in that pot which if you separate them out um, and plant them separately they'll get big on their own if you plant them all together like that they will stay smaller individually i mean you'll have like one big bushy plant but it's actually several plants going growing near each other if you separate them you get a lot more volume and that makes that five or six dollar pot a lot more economical if you're actually getting seven or eight plants out of it but um i just sow it myself basil is very very easy to grow from seed if you do not have a lot of space to garden growing herbs like basil that are annuals uh, that, that grow super simply from seed and grow really great in a pot I think this is a fantastic place to start so I'm gonna I have this one tray with these three and a half inch pots um, and I'm gonna start multiple seeds of each kind in each one of these pots and then when it comes when they get bigger I'll separate them into separate pots and then that way I can put basil all over my garden so I've got um, just like a plain Genovese basil. I actually bought this package from Botanical Interests, one of my favorite places to buy seeds. And they do these micro green seed packets. So this is like a, um, I don't know how much weight, six grams of seeds, pretty substantial amount. I mean, compared to like how much is in a small packet, which is 300 milligrams. Um, so you get a lot here and they're, these are sold to be microgreens. however, I mean, these are just regular basil seeds. And if you cut them off when they're sprouts, you'll have microgreens. If you grow them to large plants, you'll have big basil plants. And in here, this is a mix between dark opal and Genovese. I'll probably just sow out of this one. Um, and then that way I'll get the purple and the green. Um, I have holy basil last year. I had so much holy basil volunteer that starting this from seed, feels a little silly. However, I am going to do it anyway because the risk of not having holy basil is not one that I'm willing to take. We did till the garden where the holy basil volunteered because we're kind of reworking that space this year. And I don't know, I just don't want to risk it. If I end up having a bunch of volunteer holy basil, I'll give this away to people. Um, I've also got lemon basil, Thai basil, and lettuce leaf basil. I'm going to start all of those. And I know I have seeds for cinnamon basil somewhere, but I'm not, I don't have them out here. I'm going to go ahead and get these started and see if I can find those. I grow such a variety of basils though, because one, I love, I mean, I just love fresh herbs for cooking. I use a lot of basil. I love making pesto, um, like this lettuce leaf basil. I use that as wraps for, um, cause I don't eat bread. So I'll like do sandwich wraps with lettuce leaf basil or um, if you've ever seen lettuce wraps like at places like um, P.F. Chang's that that have like the chopped up meat and some veggies and stuff in them and you wrap it in lettuce that is so good in lettuce leaf basil and um, I mean I'll even do it with like burger patties where I'll wrap the basil around it and just eat that and then then the next thing is that we make tea so um, I have an old post about making basil tea Will's wife Taylor taught me about it um, Will and Taylor had started making basil tea and they were like in love with it so they were bringing it with them to come here and it's so fascinating because when you cook with like lemon basil, cinnamon basil, whatever, holy basil, you might not really get the fullness of the difference of those flavors. Like if you've seen all those different kinds of basils, but they smell, you can kind of smell it, but when you go to cook with it, you don't necessarily taste it as much. You really, really taste it in tea. So like cinnamon basil, 
taste very cinnamony and when you add the honey in with it it's like got this kind of red hot flavor to it lemon basil um, when you add the honey into that kind of has this lemon head flavor to it like the flavors are much more distinct in the tea and that's why I like to have such a variety and the last thing is I mean basil is great for uh, pollinators once it if you're done with it you don't want to prune it anymore you don't want to harvest it anymore you just let it go and it goes to seed and it makes the bees and butterflies so happy so I feel like you can't go wrong if you have this space filling in all the spaces with basil it brings diversity and um, it's it also just has so many great uses let's plant some seeds Ten minutes on a random Monday morning is going to result in gallons and gallons and gallons of tea and jars full of dried herbs and lots of pestos and wraps and delicious salads. Isn't that so cool? The nicer the weather gets, the harder it is for me to contain myself. <laughs> And like talk myself out of getting out of here and putting a bunch of stuff in the ground that really does not need to go in the ground yet. I have to wait. Now you can look up, you know, I talk a lot about your average last frost date. You need to know that. Uh, but you can also look up your average last hard frost, uh, which is where it gets lower than, let's see, I think 28 Fahrenheit, um, negative 2 Celsius is what's considered a hard frost in most places but anyway you can look up your average last hard frost which we are getting close to that point um, typically the last hard frost here in the Midlands of South Carolina is like the first week in March but then our average last frost date is four weeks later so it can still freeze it's just not going to freeze real hard uh, and that's nice that means that at this point like you can plant out any of the brassicas, any of the frost hardy things that can withstand a freeze, but that would be damaged by a hard freeze, like it's safe to go ahead in a lot of places and put those out. <laughs> All right, that was softer than I was anticipating. <laughs> oh, bear. All right, let's back up from there. <laughs> The ground is still pretty saturated from all the rain we got this weekend. I better not walk in into that space right now. So this was our no dig garden um, and we will likely kind of reestablish that but we reset this space because we are not doing the big in-ground garden over here this year uh, because we're going to be building our house and it's like right there. And I just feel like that's asking for trouble. So we're gonna knock all of these rows down with like a box blade and let the grass take over, which will not take much time at all. And so this space is gonna be the pumpkins and okra and the rambling in ground things, which also means that a lot, if you know, if I get a ton of volunteer holy basil over here again this year, I'm gonna have to take the, you know, the scuffle hoe to it and just dig up a lot of it because I don't want, um, you know, I want to make the most out of this space. Growing food really is incredible. And I walk in these spaces and just consider how much there will be to eat from this small space. And no more effort than this took. It's really amazing. There's so many dandelions growing everywhere because we've been like blowing the seeds everywhere because I want the dandelions. <laughs> but they're all over the place. All right, guys. Well, I think this is it for us this morning. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today and all the days you do. I bless you. Until next time.